From shanties to selkies to nessies and kelpies, there are definitely some interesting folklore around water. First up are kelpies. Kelpies are a shape-shifting, water-lingering, human-seducing machine. Sounds human, but they're actually horses. Shape-shifting horses. Being spirits who inhabit water in Scottish folklore, even though water horse spirits appear in many other places, such as the ones I'm going to point out right now. Also, let me know what you guys think of this new hand animation I'm trying out. Now, let me just point with this one and bend the other two. There we go. So here, here, somewhere around here, and occasionally over here. Anyway, Kelpies are said to be much stronger than ordinary horses, and can sometimes be tamed or tricked into working for you. Their hooves are on backwards, and anybody who touches them becomes glued stuck as the horse drags them underwater. When disguised as a human, there's a few traits that can give away that it is a Kelpie, like their hair has water weeds in it, and some accounts even say they keep their hooves. One way to tell if it's a Kelpie is to shout hey at it, and if it replies with, No thank you, I'm fine, you'll know it's a horse. Oftentimes their intentions are malicious, wanting to drown and eat women and children, leaving only the entrails to float up to the surface, though occasionally a Kelpie is described as longing for human companionship. Now let's get to know the Kelpie a little better by hearing a few stories about them. There once was a Kelpie who went onto land, as desperate and lonely as any old man. He transformed into a handsome young man, a real mad lad of a chad attempting to woo a pretty young woman who was quite witty and glad. When he was near, she noticed something peculiar. Recognizing it were a kelpie, she took his necklace, and then he realized that was reckless. He lost his magic power and changed back to a horse. She brought him to her father, a farmer, to work, of course. A year had passed by and she felt a bit shy. The girl began to ponder and really started to wonder. She said, Oh, I know just the man, and took him to an old wise man. He said to put the bridle back onto the horse, to which he transformed back into a man, was presented a question to answer, of course. It was whether or not to be a real man. You could turn into a mortal, no longer being horsey, or become somewhat normal, and cease being a Kelpie. He looked at the girl to propose. If I were a man, would you be my wife? She agreed, without being opposed, and with the marriage we come to a close. Here's another story of the Kelpie. A group of kids were playing around when suddenly a horse came up to them, as if he were inviting them to climb on and horse around. Several of the kids playfully got on, although one of the kids remained on the ground. He put his hand on the neck, at which point he noticed his hand was stuck. The horse then started making a beeline for the water line, and the kid was forced to grab his trusty Swiss army knife from his pocket so he could whittle a sharp stick to use to cut off his hand. Meanwhile, the other kids were stuck as the horse ran into the water, drowning them. You might think, oh, that's good. The third kid didn't get on, so at least the horse's capacity for carrying children is limited in some kind of conceivable way. But the horse's back can actually grow to accommodate as many children as necessary, making it suitable for those extra-large families of 12 children people had back in the day, which were ironically so large in order to combat these sort of mass drowning situations. Some say these stories were used as cautionary tales to keep children away from playing around dangerous water and drowning, as well as to stay away from wild animals. But I think this is simply the case of a farm-related glue accident. Think about it. The hooves are on backwards, and all it would have taken is one small farming accident. Oh, dang it. Then, in an attempt to glue the hooves back on, eh, what the hey, <laughs> get it, hey. This stuff is made from horses anyways. Probably by someone who didn't understand what horse glue was, accidentally glued them back on. Oh, crapper stabber. I put the hooves on backwards. But literally back on. Like, like backwards. Then from there, there was a minor glue accident. Shoot, he kicked the bucket. Spilling glue all over the horse, also killing him from off-gassing glue in the process. Double shoot, he kicked the bucket again. And voila. You have a sticky spirit horse whose glue never dries because it's in the spirit realm. Ah, women. Uh, I'm, I mean mermaids. It's uh, all the all the um, all the downsides of women with none of the benefits. I'm of course referring to the um, the bits in between the legs. That's what that's what counts. I'm 
of course referring to the ability to go on long walks on the beach. Huh, okay. So anyway, uh, mermaids. One of the first appearances of mermaids goes back to the Assyrians. Adagatus was born from an egg. The mysterious egg fell from the skies and into the Euphrates, whereupon fish gently nudged it to the shore and doves incubated the egg. Later along in the life process, things got rough. Adagatus fell in love with a shepherd's boy, whom she did the deed with and bore a daughter. Some sources say it was the act of love that killed him. Others say it was the act of love that killed him. In the first case, it was the physical act that made him croak. Feeling ashamed that she had accidentally killed her lover, she decided to kill herself by throwing her body into a nearby lake. In other versions, after she bore her daughter, she was too ashamed of the illicit act of love and purposefully killed him, afterwards trying to kill herself too by lobbing herself into the lake. Regardless for how she ended up in the lake, once in the water, she turned into a fish. But not just any kind of fish. The waters wouldn't conceal her beauty and kept her upper body human, thus becoming mermaid. Later on in mermaid lore takes us to sirens, who are depicted as having the body of birds and head of women. They tempted sailors with their voices, drowning them and crashing their ships into rocks, causing those who heard to perish. Later along the line in the medieval times, sirens began to be depicted as mermaids as well, possibly explaining why mermaids are sometimes seen as super dangerous, wanting to sink ships and drown sailors, while other times they're more good. Anyway, taking mermaids off the menu, we've talked about what tempts sailors, but what instills fear into their swashbuckled boots? <laughs> semen fears? More like semen fears, am I right, ladies? Why so scared? Anyway, it's pigs. Pigs were thought to be bad. Pigs would oftentimes be the only survivors after shipwrecks since their wooden crates floated, and while this is simply the case of survivorship bias, <laughs> get it? It nevertheless created the association between shipwrecks and pigs. So pigs, shiver me applewood timbers. Another would be whistling. It's thought if you whistled out at sea, you could whistle up a storm. Scary. Because of these fears, you would occasionally see some pubs that were named Whistling Pig Sex to allow sailors to indulge in all the things they couldn't while out at sea. Another would simply be Bananas. But sir, why are they afraid of bananas? Hmm. Well, it's a similar situation to the pigs. Floating. But also, their fruit. Oh, their fruit. Specifically bananas, which means they release methane gas when being ripened. And so the ship has to sail fast in order to arrive quick enough before the fruit spoils. Which also meant their pace was unsuitable for fishing and stuff. Being from the tropics, they also can carry deadly spiders. Well, I'll be darned. Why'd you even ask if you already knew the answer? I don't know. I just got an inexplicable urge to verbally communicate this information in an easily digestible format. In recent news, mermaids are back on the menu. A recent finding suggests mermaids could have simply been mistaken for seals, walruses, or manatees all along. They sure look like women to me. Sailors who have made sightings of mermaids could have done so either because of poor eyesight extended periods of solitude, or fermenting fruits hotboxing the entire ship. Christopher Columbus claimed to have seen mermaids on his voyage to the Americas, saying they were not as beautiful as they are represented. It's now regarded as one of the first sightings of manatees in North America. All this talk about seals being mermaids takes us to our next segment on selkies. For more information about selkies, We'll be going to our resident ocean folklorologist on site at the ocean today, Tess Tickleson. Oh, what? 
he isn't there, well, then just cut.